Automation is powering what's possible for businesses of every size in every industry. Unlock your potential at Automate, the largest showcase of robotics and automation in North America, May 22nd through the 25th in Detroit, Michigan. With over 600 exhibitors, 200 speakers, and more than 25,000 registrants, there's no better way to power your business. Register for free at AutomateShow.com. That's AutomateShow.com. Here for the real talk, it's the Dare to Ask podcast, episode seven, Private Investigator ENT. I like to call myself an investigator. Give me all of the information we can and go from there with figuring out what's going on. I'm Corey Jensen, your host for this Dare to Ask podcast. I'm a mom to a big family and have delivered five babies. And like many women, I try to stay informed about my wellness as well as the health of my kids. We've created a space to have open conversation about what's going on with the woman's body without feeling intimidated in a clinical setting. A place to talk like girlfriends do. A space that dares to ask. We're here to make a connection, be authentic, and really get to know your provider. Yes, know the person behind the stethoscope dare to ask will be where you hear the questions that we are all curious to know but just need a space to do it you've landed on the dare to ask podcast show hosted by Corey jensen and sponsored by essentia health i like to say from clavicles to eyebrows everything starts viral getting to sit down with mandy wheeler whose forte is an ent ear nose and throat at essentia health It's fascinating the way Mandy can bring that girl next door vibe to her patients while wearing her certified nurse practitioner professional title. She's a small town girl with a big heart to help. And she proves that ENT is a practice where she sees all walks of life. So how does she put her medicine practice spin on things? Well, there's a reason she calls herself a private investigator. Let's hear why. You go by Mandy. I do go by Mandy, yes. How did you get that nickname? Because you are Amanda. Correct. So I had a nickname few story. different nicknames throughout my life. <laughs> the first one was more Tommy because when I played paddling basketball as a child, there was two Amandas. My maiden name was Thomas. So they're like, hey, Tommy, Thomas. And then transitioning into adulthood, I just wanted to stand out because I felt like there's a lot of Amandas out mm-hmm. there and less Mandys. Really Ooh. standing out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Living on the edge over here. <laughs> so you played basketball I as did. a kid. Was that your chosen activity? For time, I started with soccer, moved up to Fargo-Moorhead, late elementary, middle school years, and then transitioned to basketball, then found my love of volleyball, and that was kind of it through high school, and then nothing after high school, at least um, collegiate-wise. Do you um, co-ed? Has somebody roped you into being a sub? They have (laughs) not. I actually don't even live in Fargo. I commute in from about far away, so I live in a town of less than 400 people. What town is this? Uh, So Buxton, North Dakota. I've heard of it. Our school system, we co-op with Hillsboro, but the school itself is between two small towns, Reynolds and Buxton. It's out in the middle of a cornfield. It's great. I live in a small town, too. Lived in Fargo for a decade and then in Arthur. So this is north of Castleton. So I'm all about the tiny town. Yes. Small town life is wonderful. It is. There are a lot of huge benefits. Yes. Like my kids can play outside and there's maybe a car that passes every two hours. So I'm not concerned that anything's going to happen to them yeah. while they're all playing. I had a sick kiddo and was home with her and our house is on the bus stop. I miss every day because of morning radio so I never <laughs> see bus stop pick up and whatever. And three boy neighbor boys were waiting for the bus. One of them at one point literally laid down in the road. <laughs> laid there. <laughs> Protector. Mm-hmm. I would run out and say something but I was yep. like there's just nobody just around. <laughs> okay, so let's talk family a little bit. Yeah. Our originally from where? You moved to Fargo-Moorhead I did. So I'm originally from South Dakota. So if you look at my bio, oh, you see too. that I went to a presentation. I finished my undergrad and my graduate school there. So I still have family in the Aberdeen, South Dakota area. Came to Fargo. My husband actually went to Barnesville, but he also grew up small town, Minnesota. We've been together now almost 10 years in the married series. Okay, nice. Neat. So uh, we met when I was 20 mm-hmm. and I would go to the gym after I was a server and would go to the gym afterwards and he was just always caught my eye. <laughs> <laughs> a little gym rat? Yeah. <laughs> 
So I called him my my gym eye candy. And then one day I just had the the ambition to go talk to him. And we've been together ever since. If you meet him, yeah, he's a chatty guy, but he's not going to be the one to approach you. I was the instigator. Rarely the gym relationship works out. It's right. usually just like rebuffed and pushed aside. Yeah, we're like, like the this. pre-Tinder relationship <laughs> goals, I guess. I guess so. <laughs> I like it. And you said you have kids. We have a six-year-old who is very spunky and then our two-year-old, who I call him a warhead. We used to call him a sour patch kid. Now he's more of a warhead just being in the terribles um, because he's mm. he's has his moments, but then he can be really sweet once you get to that <sighs> inner core. Oh, that's so cute. Yeah. Warhead. What are the names? Um, so Evelyn, who's named after her great-grandma, and then Jameson. Do they have nicknames too? Evie, and then uh, Jamie is kind of Jay, Jamie, James. All the things. All the things. Two? Boy, girl? Yes, we're down to two. Um, I had some interesting pregnancies and deliveries and uh, had a boy and a girl and we're set. So, yeah. yeah. I think I would have loved more, but at the same time, I don't think my body could have more. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So we're good with where we're at. Okay. Yeah. Well, this is extended family. If you grew up small town, was that <laughs> rural? Was that like, were you a farm kid? Um, so kind of. So when I grew up in South Dakota, my stepdad worked in agronomy at the time. And so we lived small town and I'd go out in the fields with him. Like we'd go out mudding and all the things that you can think of small town life. And same with my husband. Like he was a small, co- small town farm kid. And so they, he grew up out in the fields doing all the things. Mm-hmm. Small town life, definitely used to agricultural world mm-hmm. and just being out hunting, farming, being in the mud. Yeah. Did that influence where you are now? Somewhat, yeah. So I really enjoyed being in the city life, having like the instant gratification of what the city can offer you, but now having a family and knowing where our moral set is. Like mm-hmm. we just want that small town life where everybody knows everybody. Yeah. Really, we've been in our small town for less than a year and I know pretty much the entire entire town. Right. So Easy to do. It and is. <laughs> it makes Whether you like it or not. You know, yeah, you know, everybody, everybody knows everything, <laughs> but it's okay. Um, yeah. But, okay, so you are far-ish away yeah. from your family, your yep. extended family, yep. but not too far where you can't make a weekend of it. My parents live six hours away up in Ely, Minnesota, because they moved up there after the fact. My siblings are at least two, three hours away. My husband's family is actually here in Fargo. So we have a lot of extended family in this area, which is nice, because when there's the winter storm, like I stay in town. Me too. Let's talk a little bit education. Okay. Mandy, did she have a little <laughs> doctor set? How medicine became part of your life? I had an interesting childhood growing up. I graduated high school actually when I was 16 and I knew I wanted to do health care, but I never knew what. Right. So I kind of dabbled in a lot of different interests. Then I found nursing in general. Nursing was really like a holistic approach. Like we're in there with a patient through all in life. And then just during that, I knew I wanted to be more and be making more of the decisions. And that's what drove me to become a nurse practitioner. When did you finally realize this? So young when you graduate I high was, school. I had a lot of different experiences in my early college years. But then I think more when I met my husband, it was, uh, okay, I know I need to figure out what I really want to be doing with life and I just noticed that I just had this caring nature and like how I always wanted to take care of people and that's just how nursing early 20s mid 20s when I really decided walk me through that again <laughs> where did you all go gambit so I went to UND for two years had a lot of fun and then I went to MSUM read between the lines everyone <laughs> we're all young we all have our experiences yeah, shapes us. well right and that's why I tell people like I'm going to be probably one of the least judgmental people because I've done some things that were questionable, but <laughs> but it made me who I am today. Yeah. It made me have that bigger approach to what could be going on in people's lives. UND, and then I went to MSUM, and it's not like the tri school area here where things transfer really nicely. Right. So not a lot transferred and I was really frustrated. So then I went to the tech and that's where I actually got my first degree. Um, I just got my liberal arts, associates liberal arts. Then I did my associates as a practical nurse at MSA here in town. And then that's where I continued on with presentation with finishing my undergrad and my graduate degree. And this is where you landed. And this is where I landed. Yeah. (laughs) And here we are. And here Um, we are today. And how long have you worked at Essentia? So I've been at Essentia since March of 20. 16. Um, I had a couple of variations in between there, but they've always been my home. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I started in women's care, um, okay. women's health. I was there for about three and a half, four years, and then I transitioned.
transition to the OR once I got my RN, my BSN degree, and then that's where I met our group. I got to do a lot of the ENT cases. It wasn't necessarily my specialty, but because of the shift I worked, I worked a lot of their cases, and I loved my ENT cases. Okay. And so I got that rapport with them then, a nice transition to where I am now. That evolution. Where you are right now, how did that come to be? And it just happenstance, and hey, this is really, this feels right. Right. Oftentimes, it's the people. It is, that, yes. That draw you into a certain area. Yeah, and we have just a wonderful group. Like, between myself, and I have Brooke here with me, um, we have three other physicians that we work with, mm-hmm. and between the three of them, there's 60 plus years of experience, and they have, like, all their little niches that we can just pull from and learn from, mm-hmm. and they're wonderful. In ENT, you see all ages. I do, yeah. So, anything from a couple weeks old through the lifespan. So, it makes your day interesting to say the least. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. Now, not picking favorites, but totally picking favorites. Is there an age range that you connect with most? That's kind of a loaded question because I think I enjoy all of my patients in different stages. I love seeing the infants and the toddlers because that's kind of the stage of life we're still in currently. So I just feel like I can bring the mom out and me to connect with them. Totally. And then I also really enjoy my geriatric patients because they're super sweet and they're kind and they just, they know you're there to help them. Mm -hmm. They're appreciative in all levels. It's that stressful in-between age. (laughs) (laughs) Patients who are my age or older are in between and it's like, oh, we have a lot going on in life Mm -hmm. because we're managing not only ourselves, but those around us. I feel like it might be a no-brainer, but maybe not. The busiest season in your career, (laughs) what what season is that? I would definitely say winter because everyone's trying to get in for surgeries if possible. Um, So really this push, and then I do know from like my OR days, then we had the aftermath of the, the fiscal year end, the insurance deductibles, and even like January, February is busy. But from talking with our audiologists, because we work really closely with our audiology team as well, all of our snowbirds seem to go. So a lot of those patients, like we see less of, it's more of the kiddos and and young adults that were the stage. What do you do in the summer then, if there's a little bit more of a relax? Do you vacation in the summer? My husband works in agriculture. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, enough said. (laughs) He's an agronomist and he works with a really large farm here. Here in the in the area, we actually planned our wedding even around like his life schedule because yep. it's either winter time if you want a very cold wedding environment, mm-hmm. or there's a little gap between planting and spraying, yep. <laughs> and spraying the fields to checking the fields and then harvest. So mm-hmm. there's like a two week span in June and early August where you can choose to get married, um, <laughs> or else you wait till winter. I married a teacher, so same, <laughs> not the same. So we got engaged at the beginning of August, and so it was well we could get married over Christmas break yeah, or, or next summer. summer. That was the option and yeah. we chose Christmas break. So summer times, I mean, we tried to go to the lake, but again, the closest lake to us is Golden Lake, I believe, which is about 45 minutes or else it's at least a two-hour drive for us mm-hmm. to go anywhere. And with two small children, it's a little harder. We like to go out in the field. Like we have recreational equipment. So my <laughs> my daughter at the age of five learned how to drive a razor. That's fun. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Not stressful. Not, Not stressful. keeping you up at night. No, no we had a, a new build and we don't have grass still or we didn't all mm-hmm. summer. So it was a lot of playing in the dirt and building <laughs> dirt castles and just sure. enjoying those times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How was the building process for you? It was long, but honestly, I think the easiest part for us was just actually picking things out because we've been wanting to build for so long before mm-hmm. we did that we had down to T like what we wanted, even design wise. Straight to your Pinterest board and like <laughs> this was all the things that I pinned. Well, so we actually watched a lot it. of the parade of homes and we yes. had some builders call us out like, okay, this is your four. You've been in our homes. Like, when are you going to jump the gun? <laughs> like, what is going on? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, we were called out by a couple. This is the season you're in. So yes. now you new home. Let's go back to clinic. Okay. What is your day-to-day? Typical or average day. So I usually start anywhere in the morning between 8 and 8.30. My morning patients are truly like post-op the first two. So I see a lot of like post-op ear tubes and tonsillectomies, um, sometimes some thyroid cases. Um, And then I go into more of like consults and rechecks. So I'll see anything from um, frequent ear infection kiddos to, to concerns with tonsils to adults with 
nosebleeds or hearing mm. concerns and then just some ear cleanings thrown in there and those are the kind of like the reprieve like odd in the, the sense that I enjoy doing the ear cleanings okay so we've got a doctor pimple popper on our hands here but yeah, for ears in the ears yeah <laughs> pretty much uh, so yeah the dirtier they are the better because then when you get them clean and they look pretty it's like ha huh, just a relief right <laughs> there's some gratification there there's I know a lot it's of pretty gross but also there's some gratification so I yes. the next thing would be what's the oddities found in the ear or the nose. So I found like tips to hearing aids in the ears, incidentally rocks in the ears, just from summer at the lakes, like they don't realize it, but then I'm cleaning the ears. I'm like, oh, there's a rock in there. Had beads. There's been like rubber bands. There's, Mm. there's lots. It's fun though. (laughs) For me, it's fun. For the patient, maybe not so much in the moment because it can be traumatizing. Of course. Especially some of the younger kiddos, it's a little more traumatizing, but I try to be as quick as possible. And then we are also really fortunate to have child life services in our building with our pediatrics. Saving grace. I love child life services. Yep. They're so huge for little ones. Yeah. So when I, I like to prep before I see my patients and if I notice like they've used them in the past or if there's something going on with their history where they might benefit from having them there to make it a less traumatizing experience, then we try to coordinate to make sure we have them on board with us. Yeah. Do you have a recovery oddity museum? Do you keep... I have not kept any foreign the objects. Rock. No. <laughs> the foreign objects. I have not. I'll take pictures of them, though, so that sure. they're in the chart. But no, I don't keep them. Like, Yeah. That could be stinky and gross. <laughs> yes. Don't have that um, niche to myself. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is the thing I could do again and again and oh, again. Oh, for sure. Ear cleanings. Like, if I had an entire day full of ear cleanings, I would probably, like, go home on a high. <laughs> 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 the really real. I, do, I really do. I, I do outreach, too, to Austin and mm. at first it was kind of slow and I told the nurses I'm like seriously give me all your cleanings and I yeah. will go home like with a grin on my face <laughs> and I'll come back every time just like prepared. What you have basically spelled out is a lot of what I would anticipate it's from your tonsillectomies yep. to your, your tubes in the ears what mm-hmm. about the oddities when you're like I don't know what this is or yeah. we don't see this very often or this is rare. For me sometimes it has to do with vocal changes with adults with reflux disease mm. and Sometimes so you'll get an abnormal exam because we will scope patients in the clinic. And if something looks odd and I'm like, oh, I don't really know how to go about this. So that's when I touch base with the physicians because I'm like, look uh-huh. at these pictures I took. What do you think? These are their symptoms. And then they'll either be like, well, they should come see me. We should do some different type of imaging or, oh, that's fine. Or, oh, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. That's some of them because um, there can be some questionable things. If there's a history of like tobacco use or family, oh, sure. like cancers or just anomalies, Mm -hmm. then you get a little more concerned. The other thing that can be either really tricky or really easy can do anything with like hearing and ringing in the ears. Because there's so many different diseases out there that we either just let it be. We've ruled out X, Y, and Z to be a hearing loss or a Meniere's disease, vestibular disorders. And you're like, oh, you just have ringing in the ears. Sorry. This is your life now. (laughs) Right. And there's things that we advise patients that they can do to make the, the ringing less. Mm-hmm. But sometimes once it's there, it's there. So. My husband suffers from that. Just there. Yes. There's a lot of mental toll on that, too, yep. when you can't get rid of something that's just always there. Yeah. And what we found, too, is like the more you do stress on it, the worse it gets. Right. So that's why getting primary care involved, do we need to have a little more stress management on our side, sure. whether they offer something or they refer you elsewhere, it can all play into it. Wow. And specifically, like even Dr. Sen, he's like the guru of all things ENT. Um, so if I ever question something, like I'm like, "Hey, Dr. Sen, <laughs> this is we're gonna need you here. We're gonna Please need you back up, <laughs> tap. <laughs> we're gonna bring you into this." So yeah, there's a lot of things in ENT that that seem weird to the patient, and I'm like, "No, that That's sounds normal. pretty typical." Unfortunately, <laughs> I'm sorry. I had my tonsils out when mm-hmm. I was a 13 year old. Yeah, that was a few years ago. What have changed in that? That specific yeah. area. So 2020, I believe, was the last clinical practice guideline that came out regarding tonsils and tonsillectomies. Um, so what we know now is there's two reasons why at least kiddos or adolescents get their tonsils taken out. Mm-hmm. The first has to do with recurrent tonsillitis. Yep. You have to have seven tonsillitis episodes in one year in order to be considered a tonsillectomy within that year, or else it's five for two years in a row or three for three plus years in a row. And then the other indication for children, at least, is obstructive sleep apnea. 
sleep apnea in general is not tolerated in children. If mm-hmm. you were to send an adult to do a sleep study and they have a couple apneic episodes, not a huge deal. Yeah. You send a child and they have one apneic episode, it's a big deal because it can interfere with their growth and development sure. and later on um, just some chronic disease management that could be prevented by having a tonsillectomy. Okay. Is that one of the cure-alls for your tonsillitis? Um, no, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> wish it were, but wish it were. No. I wish I had Dr. Williams here to tap into because he can give you straight down statistic wise of what your recurrence rate will be then years down the road. Yeah. Because sometimes then the infection can just go deeper into the tissues of the throat. Sure. So while we're taking away the tonsils for a recurrent tonsillitis, you can still get pharyngitis or like sore throat issues and infections. Sure. When I had mine out, mm-hmm. it was because of the recurring mm-hmm. and it was so bad. Vaguely remember what it was like to be a fifth grader, but what I remember in the fifth grade was how sick I was and always missing school. And it was just repeatedly tonsillitis, strep throat again and again and again. And my scheduled surgery had been scheduled by the third time I finally got it because then Mm -hmm. I would get sick right before the surgery and I'd have this whole thing again. So I literally can remember Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter was all sick in a way on those holidays and it Mm -hmm. being so depressing. But for me, once the tonsils were out, wonderful, gone, yep. wonderful. Didn't have strep throat again until I was an adult. Right. With so, kids. Kids. Yep. <laughs> They're little Petri dishes that we love to death. I know. But I know. I know. What we experience as children, then once we have children, we're like, oh, hey, here it is again. Yes. <laughs> yes. Let's talk those ear infections. Is there something we're missing as parents to help prevent this stuff? Yes and no. So a lot of times, <laughs> I like to say from clavicles to eyebrows, everything starts viral. Ear infections by nature are going to be viral first and that can be up to seven days. They'll start to seem like they're getting better and then it's like a flip of a switch and they're worse. That's how we kind of know it's transitioned into more of a bacterial infection versus viral infection. And to help prevent it, I like to call them drive-bys irrigations to the sinuses because really in our pediatric population, they don't really have sinus issues. They have nose and adenoid issues. So when those get infected with where they lie, it can travel up into the eustachian tubes into the ears. So Mm -hmm. if you you're cleaning out their sinus cavity at least once a day, Mm -hmm. then you can help negate some of the infection risk. Not all of it, but it's a good preventative measure. You're going to be really specific. I would do it at bedtime after they've kind of like gone through the day, been at daycare, exposed to all these different irritants. Get them out the system before they go to bed. And what is your preferred method to do that? I brought my little guide for (gasps) you. Um, Neti pot. (laughs) So neti pot is great. I am not coordinated, so I have to be in a shower. I like the Neomed sinus rinse. I, this is not an advertisement for them. This is yeah. just like what I found because it's all self-regulated with the, how you squeeze through it. And actually with some of my foreign bodies and children in the nose, I actually use the sinus rinse to flush them out. Okay. Because they don't tolerate you putting in all these little instruments in their nose. Sure. So this is just good. You can go to an actual navage too um, where it does all the work for you. But in children that might not be tolerated. So mm. literally you just do a good flush, good squeeze, get it through their nose, gets all the boogers and gunk out. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> for the neti pots. <laughs> situation. <laughs> More pediatric little bitties. The Frida, what is your thoughts on that? Ugh. It's great for those who can tolerate it. <laughs> <laughs> Both baby and adult, right? Yeah, so uh, that was kind of my thing. Before I got into ENT, I was really nervous coming into the profession because being in the OR, like when you see the tubes come out of the throat, it's like oh. they're very gunky, and I couldn't tolerate it. I yeah. had to turn away. I'd still be there, but I have to turn away for the actual tube coming out. So I was like, oh, am I going to be able to manage this? in ENT because we're in throats and noses. You're in and all that. It's been fine. I actually enjoy <laughs> it now. I think it's because I'm in the control aspect sure. of it. But with the nose, Frida, when you're sucking out them boogers, it's just, mm. if you can tolerate it as a parent, it's a great option. But for those who can't, I would definitely do the rinses that can flush it out for you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I did the Frida on my youngest ones because it wasn't around for the oldest ones. <laughs> we got through it. The thing that grosses me out the most, and I just want to know where your position is, is the no the bulbs. I think they're good. Like Recommendation? We use the, I use the, the, we still have one from when my kids were born. We still use them, mm-hmm. but I like to flush them, especially if they're really yeah. getting gunky. I just flush them out. And my kids have gotten used to it, so I can do an entire squeeze bottle on them, which is eight ounces. But if your children aren't going to tolerate it, just do a quick yeah. flush. Try not to touch your face. Wash your hands. Yes. <laughs> you know, all of that to get us through the cold and flu season. Yeah. One of the things that I had just recently started doing on my seven-year-old, because she was the last one that was sick in our house, pressure in her sinuses. Yeah. And that was just simply the pushing on her sinuses with my yep. thumbs 
to just help relieve the pressure. Relieve the pressure. That was huge for her because yep. she felt some relief right. immediately and it wasn't very invasive. Well, and I haven't done a ton of that or educated on it, but I'm all for holistic things. So mm-hmm. if it's not hurting them physically and you're getting relief, I'm all for right. interventions that your children or even as an adult will tolerate. Not great to give you resources that you're not going to use, but if you find some and then I can find the clinical data to back it up, like I'm all for adjusting my practices based mm-hmm. on evidence practice because mm-hmm. healthcare is ever evolving and that's how we practice in our department and essentially in general is evidence-based care. Yeah. So if things change, then we're going to adjust how we practice to what is the newest data. Yeah. Is there something that's exciting that you're seeing for growth or change? Again, I'm going to reference Dr. Williams because he is like an encyclopedia for statistics and just knowing things that are upcoming. And there's something with hearing loss that's up and coming because we'll have patients that come in and they're like, I can't hear. Mm. We do audiometric testing on them and everything comes back normal. Well, there is an article coming out saying that their hearing loss is real. We don't understand it quite yet of what degree it is or what is fully going on, but there's changes coming. Yeah. For those who feel like, man, I can't hear, but they keep telling me I'm normal, like there's practices that are changing and that there's more being discovered now. Okay. Hopefully we can get to the root of problems yes. much earlier. Yes. I like to call myself an investigator. <laughs> <laughs> you give me all of the information we can and yeah. we go from there with figuring out what's going on. A little PI action. <laughs> um, I always ask my guests about health nuggets, a practice that you do in your daily life. What is something that you really wholeheartedly believe in? Health nugget on your lap, Mandy. When I had the time and I'm trying to be better at implementing it, it's just getting in some daily exercise because it really helps with the endorphins and and just making you feel good. I don't think we should really think about exercises like punishment. It's to help us feel better. When my stress is at its max, like if I can go go lift some Mm -hmm. weights, we have a home gym Mm -hmm. set up now, then I'll do that to go relieve my stress. I can take out my frustrations on that versus taking them out unintentionally on like my spouse. Right, right. Yeah. That's a great health nugget. That's that's <laughs> great. Is there anything else you'd like to leave us with today? Going back to ear tubes and ear yeah, infections, yeah. I actually brought the practice guideline update because we're looking less at how many infections kiddos have, but or even adults, and more at how long fluid is lasting in their ears. Because before, we would just be like, oh, you've had three infections, six months, four in a year, let's just put tubes in your ears. We're kind of changing our tune on that now. Okay. The most recent guidelines came out in February of this year saying that infections, as long as they're tolerating the antibiotics, they don't have any chronic health conditions or they're not having any adverse events with their infections like hospitalizations. Yeah. They don't necessarily need tubes, but when they're having fluid left over in their ears longer than three months, within three months, most people, 90% will overcome fluid in the ears. But if it's lasting longer, it's not going to happen. And those are like the perfect candidates for ear tubes. You see the world of difference because their speech language development comes up more. They're being more reactive to sounds in the home. And even sometimes like their ability to be stable with walking increases, especially in those, those smaller children who are getting to those walking stages stages is where you see the benefits. Exciting change too. Yeah. And I'm definitely the conservative person um, because surgery is surgery. Right. Anesthesia has its own side effects. So yep. if we can be more watchful waiting in children, that's a really great approach to take because it's it's a risk factor. Yeah. When I send kiddos for surgery for tubes, like they come back and it's a world of difference. I think that that's definitely been a critique is that it feels like everybody's getting tubes and it's just yep. like an immediate fix, just not even Right. And they don't necessarily see. prevent infections. They just give us a different way to treat. And I know it's hard because I had my own kids have gone through the phases and ebbs and flows of having a lot of ear infections, but then there's a flip of a switch and we haven't had one in like a year now. I feel like sometimes the communication isn't always coming out right. And so I just want to say like, we're on your team. We're just trying to do what's best for your child. Along with you, like we really listen and hear your concerns. And Mm -hmm. if we don't get the answers that you're wanting today, it doesn't mean that it's never going to happen in the future. Your entire approach is so inviting. It really feels like you're listening and not just clinical hard facts, yes, no's, big team approach on almost yes. every level. So Yes, and we, we like to utilize our resources. So I'll mm-hmm. even be like in my office and I'll have pediatricians messaging me like, hey, this is going on with this kiddo. Like, what would you recommend? And sometimes too, we can just send them to audiology first. Is their hearing actually being affected? Is there other concerns? We're very much a team approach mm-hmm. in that we refer back to each other and we'll just direct message just being like, this is what's going on. Do you have any, any tidbits to 
to help out. Yeah, I love it. So. Today was fun. <laughs> it was well fun, done. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me, giving us some insight into the world of ENT. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me and for allowing us to be here and kind of speak our practice. Yeah. Mandy was great. I really love where she's at with what's happening in the future with ENT and just technology as it advances. That's always such um, a glimmer of hope for the rest of us when we see our doctors and our providers get excited about what's coming just to help more. Speaking of helping more, we're going to plan on doing just that as this season three continues. We're halfway through. I can hardly believe it, but we're now well into the second half of season three. So let's get you back here with the new Dare to Ask podcast next week. The information contained in this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for personalized professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The information is general in nature. If you have questions or concerns, please contact your provider. Automation is powering what's possible for businesses of every size in every industry. Unlock your potential at Automate, the largest showcase of robotics and automation in North America, May 22nd through the 25th in Detroit, Michigan. With over 600 exhibitors, 200 speakers, and more than 25,000 registrants, there's no better way to power your business. Register for free at AutomateShow.com. That's AutomateShow.com.